let's see where we're at. So mostly we're going to be doing um, kind of uh, lecture stuff today regarding continuous time optimization. Okay, um, some pretty cool stuff. I think uh, just sort of like the, the I mean, there's the one main theorem that tells you how to use sort of the, do this Hamiltonian style optimization stuff. Um, and then we're going to apply that to the Ramsey problem. Um, and that makes pretty quick work of it, to be honest. Um, and then uh, after that, then, then we can start looking into sort of things relating to stability. Okay. Um, and I guess, yeah, so the, the, the stability stuff uh, is, is general for systems of, of differential equations. Okay. So, I mean, like, what we get out of the maximum principle, as we'll call it, um, for Hamiltonian optimization is uh, as another system of differential equations, basically. Okay, uh, let me just make sure my door is closed here. Not closed. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so it's going to give us a system of differential equations, okay, and then we're going to then look at stability. But the stuff that we do for stability, you know, if, if you just have it works for any differential equations, okay? So it's not just optimization, but that's gonna be our main application anyway. So um, yeah, so we're gonna do that. Uh, and then, um, I don't know, did you guys have, I, I haven't actually, I, I've been kind of busy here. Uh, I, I haven't put up the solutions yet. I'm gonna do that. Um, did you guys have questions on the homework? I think the solo stuff, seems like you I mean usually the solo stuff people are okay with and also like those are the same problems I gave in the past years so like that stuff is out there is my understanding although it might be different this year I mean it, I don't know how much like communication there is with the upper years but um, I, I'm gonna post that anyway but so so whereas the Malthus stuff I don't know that was a little in my mind that was a little trickier um, although it seems like you guys had a pretty good handle on it um, yeah okay so Okay. 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 So, um, yeah. So I guess. Well, let me. I'll, well, I'll post the problems and then uh, I'll post the solutions. And if you guys have further questions, that we can discuss further. But I guess um, the the one thing I guess. Yeah. All right. Well, so for for the Malthus stuff, I'll just sort of say out loud, and then and then, I, and then we can we can discuss formally later. Um, I mean, so the the Malthus the, for the first one, you know, that was that was just looking at that that right hand side of the demographic transition. So we, we had in general, we can have um, an increasing demographic curve and then decreasing, which is possibly the most realistic one. This one just kind of I, I wanted to have a functional form, so I figured I'd focus on the right hand side. So that still gives you multiple equilibria. You can end up in the bad zone, and it's actually worse in some sense because, well, yeah, I mean, it's worse because you actually converge to zero uh, 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 standard of living because like there's no, when things get bad, actually the population growth is the highest um, and there's nothing to sort of short circuit that like in Malthus where it goes down again. So. Um, and then you get the, the sort of the high growth one where you where you, you, you just continually grow in terms of Y. Okay, so that's the basic outcome for number one. Um, and then number two is just like, so it's so basically number two adding in that endogenous growth kind of kills off the bad equilibrium. Because, and, and really the, the key here, which, which I think is something that's gonna be generally useful, um, is it's, it's uh, let me pop over to the, iPad here. So the key is, you know, we have this, um, so this is like the Malthus problem. Okay. Um, and so we, we, we added in this term here. Okay. And I mean, so this is saying that, you know, the, the rate of technological, the, the absolute rate of technological change is proportional to population. Right. And so, you know, the, the way you, you know, the, I kind of wanted to guide you with the way I asked the questions, which is like, well, think about it in terms of growth rates of Z, and you're going to get this, okay? And so then the way you do the balanced growth path logic here is you say, 
Well, we want z to be growing at a constant rate. Okay, so we want this to be some constant here. And if that's going to be true, it has to be that this ratio, uh, eta is constant, just L over z has to be constant, okay, which means that gl should be equal to gz. Okay, so that's um, that's the basic logic. So, so you, you, any anytime you, you end up in a situation where you have sort of this, here we have this proportionality between the rate and the level, but then if you divide and turn it into a growth rate, then you actually get this proportionality between the levels themselves. Okay, so that's, it, it's a little tricky. I mean, people, you know, when it, when I first saw it, and, and when people first see it, there's some. It does not not mean to be obvious, especially when it's like just a pure linear thing. But basically, that's that's how you can do it. Is that at the end of the day, you want this growth rate of z to be constant, okay? And the other thing you can do, which is you didn't need to do this for the problem, I don't think, for the solution. But the other thing you can do is once you once you have this, once you have basically that g some constant g z is equal to a to l over z, okay? So this is actually, how should I say this? This is, this is going to be, this is something that we're going to have to be true, like in steady state. Okay. In the short run, there are going to be dynamics, right? If um, Z is really large, you have a super advanced technology uh, base, which is like you had Wikipedia around for some reason, but then there are only like a hundred people. Um, you're not going to advance technology in, in, a, in a proportional sense very fast because you only have 100 people trying to advance the sum total of previous human knowledge, which was created by a bunch of other people. I don't know what happened to them. We're not going to specify what happened to them. But um, yeah, so you're not going to, in, in absolute terms, maybe you're doing okay, but in proportional terms, you're not going to grow that fast. Okay. So that's, and then in the, the inverse of that is uh, you have not, not very advanced technology, but a ton of people you're gonna get huge proportional growth in technology because you just have so many people working on this stuff. Okay, so that ratio is gonna tell you about the growth rate, okay? Um, and so, uh, yeah, and so then, you know, if, like, if you, if you look here, so Z over Z, so if, if you have that case where you have more people relative to technology, you're gonna have a high growth rate and vice versa. So that's just sort of reflected um, in the algebra, okay? And so then, so, so essentially, now your state is kind of y uh, and sort of this relative value of l and z, okay? And in, in the long run, okay, uh, the, so, so in the short run, these are going to evolve. This one according to your uh, demographic equation and gl and stuff like that. And this one's basically going to evolve according to our gz equation on the left here. Okay, so then the short run stuff's gonna happen. Okay, but then in the long run, we're gonna have GZ equals some GZ, which is gonna be equal to GL, right? GZ equals GL, and also it's gonna be equal to this. So, um, and in fact, if, if you're in this, this long run growth situation where, where your standard of living is improving, that um, what is it, it converges to. Uh, N2, so it starts at N2, which is, I mean, it's backwards. It's, yeah, it starts at N2 and it goes down to N1. So, so N1, so you're gonna end up down here, um, right? And you can actually invert even this equation, N1 equals eta times L over Z, and find out what is actually L over Z, which is just N1 over uh, eta, okay? In the, in the long run, right? That's only in the long run, okay? Um, or, it, I don't know, maybe it makes more sense to think about Z over L at the relative level of technology would be, you know, eta over n1. Okay, so you can actually find that ratio and stuff um, just by inverting these steady state equations. Okay, so um, so that's uh, th that's how that works. Um, we're going to look at that later on. Okay, um, when we start endogenizing, so this, this is our, sort of our first look at endogenizing technological growth in a very simple way when we start doing it later we're gonna have stuff that looks like this um there's gonna be some more exponents flying around but um we're gonna have stuff that looks like this and, and we're gonna use similar logic where it's like okay we need to figure out how how good is technology rel relative to the existing base of technology how fast it's going to grow what does that imply and we're going to use similar logic okay so this, this will give you a little bit of an idea but the key here is that because we've endogenized z right remember in the in the sort of full-on Malthusian model we you know we had something like this right this was GL this was Y here right 
and then we decided that there were whatever GZ was, you could draw this threshold, which uh, sort of delineated the zones where Y was going to be growing and where it was going to be falling. Okay, so like basically um, in uh, in this zone, you know, you're you're heading downwards, um, or no, sorry. In this zone, you're heading up uh, because technology is, is like, the, sorry, the growth rate of labor is relatively low compared to technology. In this zone, you're heading down, okay? And in this zone, you're heading up, okay? So basically that gives that, that gives you this bifurcation result where depending on your initial condition, whether it's, it's above or below this sort of Y, I don't know, hat value, okay? Uh, you're either going to go down into that bad equilibrium or you're going to head up into the high one, okay? But it was that, that critical, what's critical is this level of GZ that, you know, if, if, it's, if it's up here, okay, then, then we're, we're, we're always good. Everything's always good because technology is just amazing. If it's down here, everything is always bad. Everything is terrible because technology is not that good, okay? So, so GZ, that level, modulates whether there's only the bad equilibrium whether there's maybe the bad and maybe the good, depending on your initial st the condition for Y, and whether there's just always a good equilibrium. So that that sort of level of GZ determines that, okay? And um, by, essentially by endogenizing it, we make it so that we always kind of end up here, okay? That you're never gonna end up in the bad equilibrium because if, if, uh, you, if you ended up in the bad equilibrium, you can show that, well, Y is gonna go to zero, uh, GL is gonna be something, uh, N2, I guess, uh, but then GZ would be um, also that, okay? And that implies that GY is gonna be growing, which is the opposite of what we kind of assume. So it's kind of like proof by contradiction. If we ended up there, then actually Y would be growing, which means we wouldn't have ended up there, therefore it couldn't have happened in the first place, okay? So um, so that, that sort of, that adding in that linkage back into technology kind of short circuits the bad equilibrium. And, and make it makes it so we're only in the good one, okay? Um, all right, so that, that's sort of the intuition. Okay, I'll I'll write out the. I mean, I'll I'll post the the sort of the mathematical derivation, which which is it's really just kind of finding that that you know showing that you, you don't end up in that in that low growth uh, or zero growth equilibrium, okay? Or actually negative growth, um, and then yeah, and then the uh, part D the part D's the interpretational stuff. So that's like, um, that's that's thinking about kind of going beyond the model. Okay, so usually when we when we think about these types of models, there's the sort of literal solve the model and figure out what it implies, and then there's sort of like, okay, is this um, does this break down? Okay, because you know if you, if you start taking models really very literally, you might get some unusual implications, maybe policy implications, something like that. And then usually it's like, okay, well maybe um, we don't want to set a 99% tax rate because something there's going to be some endogenous response to that, right? So uh, or maybe you know, so so you, you, when you have a really simple model, you're going to probably get fairly extreme, say, policy implications or, or positive predictive implications. Uh, and and when you look into it, usually there's something that breaks down. It's like, oh well, you know, if you have a 99% tax rate, then you know maybe people are going to be slightly less willing to start companies or, or, or do, or they, maybe they'll move somewhere else. I don't know. Um, and it's not just taxes. It's, it's, it's any, any given policy you can think about in either direction. Okay. So, um, so here, well, we have this equilibrium, the, the extreme, uh, characteristics of it are the density, right? So you have literally super high density of, of people. Um, if, if you take the, the notion of K being land, literally, um, and it's just that technology is getting so good that that we're okay. Okay, so I didn't really say, are we allowing skyscrapers? Is that fair game? Maybe, maybe technology is the skyscrapers and we're going vertical. Okay, so which is yeah, that'd be that'd be pretty cool, I think. Um, but you know, there'd be no grass or anything, so it's, it's like kind of a bummer in some ways, unless you had artificial. But you know, it's like so it it all depends on what, how you interpret technology and in land, right? So, but um, you can you can think about well. Did, what would uh, the incentives look like that? What would the incentives to find new land, right? Uh, probably pretty high, right? Uh, in that world, it seems like a park would be super valuable. Um, so uh, you can do that, right? And you can, essentially what, it, what you, 
the approach I'm suggesting here in D is just look at these marginal products and say, if we had a little bit more land, how much more production would we have? Um, and, and same for labor, okay? And there, it looks like, um, th now the question is, do you look at just the marginal product? Do you look at del Y, del K, right? Which is, let me give myself some more space here. Do you look at del Y, del K, which is gonna be like, uh, what is it? yeah, it's alpha, so alpha Z, this marginal, okay? That's gonna be growing, because Z is growing and L is growing in, in the good equilibrium, let's say, okay? Z is growing and L is growing, so that's gonna be going up without bound. Um, or do you look at a more proportional notion, okay? Uh, del Y, del K over Y, all right? So that, because it's Cobb Douglas and everything, um, what's it gonna, it's gonna be alpha over K, Basically, it's just like, what, what do you do with the derivative is you take the original function, pop off an alpha, you lose a K. That's why this thing equals alpha over K. Um, my phone is again vibrating. My phone is just like a weirdly loud vibration mode. Okay, so um, yeah, so you get alpha over K. Now that is not changing, okay, so that's a constant. So so you have, if you, if you and so the question is, which one should we be thinking about? And I, I'm not specifying necessarily, but the way I think the way to think about it is, if if it depends on what your input is for let's say land land exploration, is your input consumption good final good like why basically, um, in which case I think it would be reasonable to think about this okay so you're giving up a uh, uh, one unit of output say and to build a ship and go explore and find some land or something, um, or is it more like labor? In which case, um, you know, you'd you'd be giving up your, you'd be giving up something like y over l, okay, right? Or actually, I should say, with labor, I mean, we have a thing for labor, which is the wage, right? You might think that the wage is, is relevant for labor, right? So, so if the weight, and and that's sort of the other part of the equation, if the wage is the y del l. Okay, so why am I saying that the wage is what the y del l? Oh. So so the the wage we, we haven't specified really a labor market here at all. So we don't know what the wage is. But if we kind of assume a competitive labor market, then the wage should be somehow related to uh, the marginal product of labor. Okay, so that's why I'm saying this is true here. Um, okay, and so this, uh, yeah, and this is equal. Um, this is also you know, it's kind of a property of Cobb Douglas. This is one minus alpha times y over l. That's just sort of subbing back in for y. Okay, so um, yeah, so so uh, in that case, if, if we're comparing, if you're thinking about, okay, I can either, uh, let's see, I can either be a production worker or I can go be an explorer and find new land, okay, right, then, then we're really comparing r and w. Okay, so in, in that case, um, yeah, maybe you could think about the ratio of R to W. Okay. Um, and let's say when you're an explorer, you find one unit of land. Okay. So that, that, that would mean you're an explorer, you spend your time exploring, you find one unit of land, get the marginal product of land, or you're a worker, you get the marginal product of labor. That's, that's the, the comparison. Okay. So if we look at that R to W ratio, um, right, so this is R which is alpha, I mean, it's gonna be relatively simple. So if we look at the R to W ratio, it's gonna be um, alpha over one minus alpha times L over K. Okay, because we add on the, just combining. So we have this R equation in, in like Cobb Douglas form, where it's just like Y times the factor share divided by the factor. Here we have the same thing for wage in Cobb Douglas form. Right, and then if we look at the ratio, then it's just alpha. You get the ratio of those those factor alpha over one minus alpha, and then you know for W, this one over L here is it's it's a one over L, so L is going to be on top, and then K is going to be on bottom. Okay, so then this is this ratio is saying that the ratio of of um, uh, sort of return on uh, marginal product of land to marginal product of labor is going up without bound over time because our population is growing. Okay, so this is going up. All right, so this would say, if you have that world where 
I can choose to be Explorer, I find one unit of land in that exploration, and I get the mar and effectively it gives me the marginal product of capital. I'm comparing that to being a worker, I get the marginal product of labor. In this case, that R is growing faster than W. Okay? That's the idea. Um, so, so in the long run, you're, if people could choose, you'd s expect to see people choosing to be explorers and going out and find some more land at some point. Okay? Explorers, conquerors. I'm not, I'm not differentiating here. Um, so, yeah, that's that, that, the, the implication there would be, okay, well, if, it, if it's a labor choice, you would expect people to, to start thinking about that explorer, conqueror uh, option, okay, and finding more land, okay? Maybe there is no land in case you're fine, but if there is land, then, then that's a thing. Um, yeah, so that's that's the basic idea. You can do the same thing for technology and, and, par and the second problem. You can say what's what's um, the the uh, marginal product of technology. Well, that that one is interesting because you, you know it just pops off the z, so you just get k to the alpha, l to the one minus alpha, right? Um, which is which is just y over z. Okay, so um, <clears throat> so then it. If you do that, okay, and you do the same thing and think about the ratio. Now we're thinking about the ratio of sort of the marginal the marginal value benefit of having some additional unit of technology to the return on being a worker, which is W. Okay, so this is now researcher versus worker. That's your choice, okay? And what did we get in that case? Well, we're going to get y over z on top, okay, and on the bottom we're going to get 1 minus alpha y over l. Okay, so then the y's cancel, that's good. 1 over 1 minus alpha, and then we're going to get l over z. Okay, so in this case, we get l over z as our critical factor for this ratio, which is going to be constant. Remember, we found in the end with uh, up here, basically that L over Z factor is going to be some constant, and we can even find out what that is. Okay, so so this ratio is going to be constant. So what does that mean? That that doesn't give us the same implication as before, where you definitely expect people to start exploring. Here, it's like even in the long run, some people are going to be researchers and some people are going to be production workers. You're going to have a balanced sort of setup. Okay, now the you know the one wrinkle here is that. Um, the uh, you know, technically, whatever this you know this remember we found we, we can even write this out right so we know that L over we found L over Z was n one over eta okay so this is just a number that's given as a function of parameters okay this ratio which means that there's a definite one of those del y del z or w one of those is definitely bigger and one is definitely smaller which technically means that everyone is either going to be a researcher or a worker. Right, because it's just like that's you know, so now that that that's what sometimes people call that a bang bang result because it's like if you change n one a little bit, then you switch from everyone being a researcher to everyone being a production worker and vice versa. Um, that's just because anytime you have a, f a sort of frictionless, costless choice here, because we all know that becoming a researcher is costless. You don't have to spend five years getting your PhD or anything like that. So. Um, yeah, so, so anytime you assume that just a uh, costless choice, you're going to get that sort of instability, okay? But, you know, maybe uh, you have a distribution of preferences or skills where some people are more prone or less prone in terms of skills or preferences to become researchers or production workers. That's going to smooth things out, right? If you have a, if you have this heterogeneity, you're going to get a distribution and, like, you can kind of smooth things out, okay? We don't need to go into details but there, but there are ways to smooth things out so you don't get this this sort of extreme result but but the 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 long and the short of here is because because this kind of converges to a constant it's very possible to imagine a world in which you have balance and i think it's quite reasonable at least within the confines of this setup okay so so that that's my take i mean i, I don't the part d's there's no real true right answer i think but that's that's kind of how i would think about it uh, just to get sort of an order of magnitude sense of which what are things growing in a balanced way or they seem to be unbalanced okay um, yeah okay so that's it for the homework I think um, 
we can once I post the solutions if you have any questions then we can we can talk then too or if you have questions now we can talk now uh, it's up to you all right okay so you seem you guys seem ready ready to rock here on, on proceeding with uh, optimization continuous time optimization um, okay so uh, actually yeah I, I I went back and looked at, at Jamuglu for the for these these uh this maximum principle theorem i realized i can make it a little bit simpler so i, ch I changed one or two things um yeah i didn't update the pdfs though i will do that but um i there's there's a little bit of daylight now between the html and the pdf but um yeah so let's go to the notes i'll share that with you slides hi there we go all right. Um, cool. Frank Plumpton. Um, okay, so where were we? We ended up basically here. I think we were we were, we were around here, kind of um, starting out with this this uh, general formulation of of an infinite horizon problem, basically. Okay. So here's, um, and then I guess in the notes, I was writing this out in the notes too. Yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, we got to the conditions even. Okay, so, so here we have the, the general formulation of an infinite horizon problem just for, for an x and a y. x is our state variable, y is our control variable. Okay, um, and uh, yeah, so um, I changed one, the one thing I changed. Okay, first of all, it's, it's a discounted problem. We have some constant discount rate. We have some objective function. There's no terminal value, and it's an infinite horizon, right? So a lot of the stuff when you see continuous time optimization um, is is a finite horizon problem with some terminal value. Okay, so uh, so you can have um, a flow value and a terminal value. So it kind of matters how do you get there, and also where do you end up. Oftentimes, where you end up is important. Okay, especially when you're in finite horizon and there's a well-defined notion of ending up somewhere. Uh, that's important. Okay, so. Um, that's more like maybe if, if if you see like stuff like a punch rag and some maximum principle stuff like that. That's like um, uh, this, this finite horizon stuff. It's pretty. Use, I mean, it's used widely in, in engineering and things like that. Okay, so um, that's related here. But we we want to go to infinite horizon. So there's always you know, when you go to infinity, things weird things happen. So you need to be a little bit more careful. Um, so that's uh, that's what we're gonna do. So so you have punch dragon stuff out there. Sometimes you'll see like Hamil Hamilton Jacoby Bellman equations. Perhaps that's more that stuff is more relevant for the value function formulation. Okay. So right now we're doing what would be analogous to a sequential formulation where you have stuff as functions of time rather than value functions as functions of your point in the state space. Okay. So we'll do the value function stuff later, but for now we're just gonna do kind of like a a time path sort of approach, okay? Um, and so we have this discounted uh, kind of, ex you know, and what's gonna be our expected utility basically uh, over consumption. Um, and here, you, your utility can depend on asset levels. Okay, so when we do it, we're just gonna have U of C in here. So our, our utility doesn't really depend on our asset levels, but maybe you care how rich you are. We know that some people are really are caught up in how rich they are. And, and broadcasting that to the world. So maybe that's a factor. We, we're not gonna rule that out, all right? Um, okay, and then you got your evolution of state. This is this is uh, as general as we need it to be, basically, because we have time dependence explicitly through R and W, and then uh, a, you know assets and consumption are gonna influence the evolution of your asset levels in the future, okay? Uh, of course, you have some initial asset level. Um, could be zero, could be anything. Um, and here, I, before I had this B thing, we don't really, I mean, yeah, I'm just gonna, it's, it's far, it's, it's very uh, much okay to just have some lower bound, okay? Um, all this is saying is that uh, there's some level of boundedness in your state. You can't go completely off to infinity, okay? Um, although this one, the next one could be negative. It, I guess you only need, honestly, I don't know why this is, you only need like a one-sided boundedness, okay? Um, that's, that's just, I mean, for the theorem in, at Jomogo, that's all they have. So the proof is like very involved. So, uh, we're not going to go through it. Okay. And, and it's like, 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just like way more stuff than we need to do. We could just take the theorem as true and run with it, okay? So, um, yeah, so that's basically that's basically all you need. And and this this we never use this constraint here. I mean, we you know the, where you would use that is like if you had a borrowing limit, okay? Right. Obviously, you can't. In these models, we're going to assume that everyone can borrow as much as they want to, basically, um, as long as it sort of holds up in the law. You, you can't do a Ponzi scheme where you keep borrowing more and more and more and more and more, uh, but you can borrow quite a bit if you want to. Um, Whereas in, in many instances, people are not able to borrow uh, for various reasons, largely uh, informational, I think. Um, and so that's gonna be, that would be potentially useful where you could set like a, you know, a minimum uh, asset level. So, so if assets are negative, you're borrowing it too. So th that would look like a minimum asset level. Okay, so that, that might be useful later on. Okay, and uh, yeah, so now, we define these Hamiltonians, right? The the regular Hamiltonian, the current value Hamiltonian, which I will, I'm, I'm just gonna use current value Hamiltonian and confusingly drop the hat and call it H, okay? And then we're good. And then we have this maximum principle, okay? So this is, uh, yeah, so then I changed the, um, Blower button here too. So, so we have this maximum principle, okay? And so, so essentially, with you know, with the, but the basic idea of the Hamiltonian is uh, you have your objective, and then you have uh, mu, which encodes uh, how how the um, changes basically in x, your state variable, should be valued, okay? Um, and then g that just gives you how they actually change, okay? So mu times g gives you how how your future value the so the present value of the future is changing oops, uh, over time, okay? So it, it's like Lagrange, okay? And in fact, if, if you have Lagrangian, classic little Lagrangian constraints that are also happening, you know, like you uh, are making a labor choice and you are choosing between leisure and work, and you, but you only have one unit of time in the day, you could have that as a Lagrangian kind of constraint. You could just throw it in the same way. Okay, and you can combine them, mix and match, right? So it's all sort of there's a linearity inherent here, so you can mix and match those. If you have multiple states, you just add it on. So you have a mu one for state one, mu two for state two, and g one and g two. So everything kind of just in the sort of the way the easiest additive way you can imagine. If you have multiple states, just add them on to the end. If you have Lagrange Lagrange constraints, add those on to the end, and they all play nice to with each other okay so that's that's good i mean you don't have to worry about like interactions and stuff like that um you, you need to be careful when taking the derivative that you remember all the dependencies but there's no like multiplicative interactions or anything like that so that's always good and so so if i ask you probably at some point i'll ask you for a homework where it's like you have multiple states or you have a constraint or something like that so just just throw it in okay all right so then um yeah so our our uh uh our conditions then are, are basically here, these um, these conditions here. So let me, I'm, I'm gonna go over to the to the, the slide, uh, the, the notes uh, on the iPad that is um, for these conditions. Okay, so uh, yeah, so you know, essentially th this is kind of what I wrote out last time, okay? Um, you have your Hamiltonian, okay? Uh, F of X, Y, mu of G, T, X, Y. And, and then these, these Basically, three equations characterize your path. So, so now our, our path is in terms of oh dear, uh, our path isn't. What is that happening? Um, for some reason, the it's decided that my hand is is conductive. I think I'm maybe I'm I'm sweating or something. I don't know. Uh, it's tough being left-handed. Okay, so you have these three variables x, y, and mu. Okay, and. Uh, these three equations are going to describe the evolution. Okay, so basically, I mean, kind of this one is is your classical first order condition, choosing your control variable y optimally. That's core. That this, I mean, they, they all depend on each variable, but like kind of this one corresponds to y more or less. This one roughly characterizes what mu looks like. Okay, and this one clearly describes the evolution of x. Okay, so it's 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 not a diagonal system. It's all interconnected, but you can kind of see there's a little bit of <clears throat> a notion of a diagonal, okay? Um, all right, so I think this one, this you know, choosing y optimally, I think is relatively straightforward. 
this is given. This is straightforward. Um, now this one, <clears throat> I think, is where you need the kind of most work on interpreting what this means. Okay, and and remember, I'm saying that mu is encoding all the sort of relevant information you need to to make a choice about about x, basically. Okay, so it's saying if I did, if I change x a little, a little bit, how does that change the whole future path of value? Okay. Um, <clears throat> And one way to think about it, okay, so I've got all this stuff here, I need to make, make a new page. All right, um, one way to think about it, um, and this, this is in the, uh, okay, yeah, the transversality, okay, we'll get there. Um, one way to think about it is, is you can actually invert that equation, okay? So uh, let's see here. Okay, so the, this is like interpreting mu. Okay, so you can invert the equation in the sense of the, the condition that we had is rho of mu of t minus mu dot of t is equal to h sub x. Uh, do we, I just want to get the order right. What are we doing? What are we saying? T x y mu. Okay, cool. So this is like the full statement of that that condition number two all right now <clears throat> um this is a okay so this is a differential form Th this actually looks like a uh, sort of value functions that we'll see in the future okay um essentially it's, it's sort of accumulating a bunch of stuff about hx okay and so you can this is an explicit inversion but i'm going to i'm going to tell you that this also, you can express it kind of in uh, integral form, and I'll, I'll kind of prove it to you too, uh, but it more of in a guess and check sense. Um, you can express this like this, rho s h, in the notes I have h hat, but I'm just gonna write h, um, p plus s, yes. Okay, so this, what I'm saying is actually kind of the solution to this in some sense, although it's not, um, yeah, I mean, the, the solution to this is, uh, let's see. So, so why? Okay, why? Why is this not? <clears throat> it's not a solution because it's actually it's recursive. Okay, because here I'm writing h of t plus s. Okay, in truth, h x of t plus s is equal to h x of t plus s x of t plus s. This whole thing. Okay, so and in, importantly, mu of t plus s. So it, it's it's still a recursive kind of equation. Okay, but it, it's not untrue. Okay, um, so this is what I mean when I write h x of t plus s is that evaluating it at that path, at the optimal path. Okay. So, <clears throat> but but okay. So then, what I'm saying is that this you can in the integral form, it's just the uh, present discounted value of that that h x path. So you're saying, okay, I change x a little bit. It's going to change x kind of in the next instant, right? So that's, uh, and then I'm going to evaluate that as h of x, uh, the effect of that, and then it's going to change it at every instant in the future, and also I'm discounting, and so that's how I'm going to value this whole thing, okay? Um, and, it's, and it's looking at not just fx, right? It's looking at hx because it's also sort of getting that recursive notion of how does your response change and everything like that. Okay, so, um, yeah, all right, and so now, so I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm asserting that this is the integral form, okay, and that's how we can interpret mu. You know, if you take a derivative, okay, okay, so if, if we say, okay, well, let's check this, what is, in fact, mu dot? Well, it's going to be, um, Why did I, hold on, let me just make sure that. It... Ah. Integration by parts. Oh, apparently we're integrating by parts. Sorry, I totally forgot about the proof being integration by parts. Okay, so this is mu dot, okay. And uh, what, when we take the derivative of that integral, actually the only place that t shows up explicitly is inside hx, 
Okay, so we're gonna get h dot of x. Okay, so that's just, okay, so th this I'm asserting here, and then the next one, so I'm, I'm kind of actually, you know, proving in some sense, okay? Um, all right, so, so you can take a derivative, okay? That's just passes through. Uh, and then you can also integrate this by parts. Okay, um, so we have, and, and the terms are gonna be the exponential part and the h dot x part. Those are, are, if you wanna call them uv terms, okay? Or this, it's u dv. So u is the, the exponential and dv is uh, the h dot of x ds, okay? Um, all right, and so what do we get? So we're gonna get that constant term that you get with integration by parts where you get u and now v, so there's no dot on ajx, and that's evaluated for the same bounds, zero to infinity, okay? And then minus, you know, the, the flip, so now it's uh, u dv. Well, yeah, so the, it's gonna be the derivative of the exponential and the integral of that h dot x term. Okay, so it's gonna be this, so the derivative of that exponential is, what's well, gonna be minus rho times minus rho s, and then that integral of h x dot is just eight x this thing here. Okay. All right, so that's <clears throat> good. And uh, now now we just have to simplify. Okay, so what what is all this? So the thing on the right, the, the second term is relatively easy. The first term, you wanna be a little bit careful. So at infinity, well, the exponential is gonna kinda of kill that, hopefully, right? So you need some, there is some kind of envelope condition at infinity that hx doesn't grow too quickly. And that's, we'll talk about the transversality conditions in a minute, um, which are somewhat, are perennially confusing to students and pr frankly professors. Uh, but they're, they're conditions that make sure that things don't grow too quickly, all right? We're gonna kind of hand wave that and say, okay, hx is not growing too quickly. So that infinity part, that's zero, okay? Because of the exponential e to the minus rho s. Uh, then zero, well, that's nicer. The, the, the exponential term is just one, and so we get hx of t. Okay, that's that's friendly. Um, and then the second term is, it's just, uh, well, you take out, you're gonna get plus rho times basically hx, right? That, you know, plus rho times that integral e to the minus rho s h of x, that's hx. Sorry, no, they're sorry, that's mu of t, that's mu of t. Okay, so you're gonna get plus rho mu of t. Okay, so th this whole, th you know, this whole thing in here, I don't know what that is, but th that whole thing in there, absent the mu, or absent the rho with the integral is mu, okay? And so then you just plus rho times mu of t. And this is mu dot of t, right? So that's, we've now gone the other direction. All we have to do now is, is uh, you know, re rearrange terms, subtract, basically, and we get our original equation, okay? Right, so we get our original equation there. So that's what we started with up top, right? Um, okay, so that's good. Uh, that, I mean, so, so, so I think, I mean, it's kind of a longer involved proof, but, um, we, we, we sort of have shown that this integral form is valid, okay, this this guy up here, all right? And that we can interpret mu as as just this this accumulated effect of all future change, uh, changes happening as a result of changing x a little bit, okay? Because, and, and the idea is like, you change x a little bit today, <clears throat> and because x is, the, the evolution of x is like x dot equals something, changing x today changes the baseline for all future dates. Right, you know, even though there's depreciation and all that, it does kind of change the baseline for all future dates, not just like the next date, right? So it's it, it, that's why we integrate all into the future, okay? Um, <clears throat> yeah, but but depreciation, of course, would show up, you know. So if, if really if you increase x today, like a, a, a bulk increase in x today. What the, the, the sort of impulse response is going to be, it's bigger and then it depreciates away, like in a capital 
depreciation world, okay, in the Ramsey world, uh, or like a solo world, really. Um, it's gonna the, the the impulse response would be it goes up and then depreciates away. Okay, so that depreciation component, the fact that we're integrating over HX and not just F, is is that's how it gets embedded in there basically. Okay, so it's it's sort of magic, but it works. Okay, um, that's how I think about mostly everything. Um, okay, so so that's that's how I I don't know. I, I think it's possibly helpful in interpreting what all this means okay in fact using this stuff is much easier than thinking about it and proving it okay so that's good um and that's what we're gonna do now. all right so we're gonna we're gonna take this approach and uh apply it back to uh ramsey okay so let's do that so the first thing we need to do is um we 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 wrote out we wrote out the optimization uh, for for the Ramsey problem, right? So that's like um, max A of T C of T this whole integral. Actually, because we have we're gonna have population growth, so put that in there, and then U of C of T. Okay, so. This is our utility objective for some path of consumption. And then uh, our, our constraints are, you know, this law of motion here. We've, we found it in, you know, normalized terms and in, in per capita terms, okay? Plus WT minus T of T. Okay, so this is just assets. We, we, in the background, we know it's going to be capital is going to be relevant at some point, but right now we're thinking about you, you just have assets you can save and borrow. And I guess I guess I should write R of T here. Okay, so, um, and then the other thing is that A of zero initial condition. All right, so that's like the full statement of a Ramsey style optimization in continuous time. All right. Um, Okay, so so we wanna what we wanna do first step is make our Hamiltonian. Okay, and once we have the Hamiltonian, then we then apply those conditions, and we're gonna be all set. All right, so uh, our Hamiltonian. Okay, so remember the Hamiltonian is just a function of state, control, and multiplier. Okay, um, so in this case, so in general, remember that the Hamiltonian was f of x y plus mu times g of x y. Okay. So our f is relatively simple. It's just u of c, and it doesn't even, like we discussed here, depend on a. Um, and then plus mu times g. So g is, it's just this thing up here. OK, that, that evolution equation. OK, I'm going to drop, uh, what just happened? I'm going to drop any t dependence. OK, so this is going to be r minus n times a plus w minus c okay so 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 really maybe you no know, maybe there should be a t comma in here okay uh I, i'm not gonna write it but because because this you know in principle this this is r of t this is w of t okay and remember it's fine to put um explicit time dependence in g that g function it works and everything okay so um yeah so this is fairly general we're facing a path of interest rates and wages, and we're still making some optimal decision. Okay, um, all right. So, so that's our Hamiltonian. All right, and it and um, yeah. Okay, and so now we can we can apply these conditions. Okay, so uh, condition number one, right, says that zero is equal to H C for consumption. That's now our control variable. So H C equals zero. Okay, and then here H C is U prime of C minus mu, okay, u prime c and then mu, all right? Um, which immediately you can see means that, you know, uh, mu is equal to u prime of c. Okay, so that's a good thing. So in this case, mu is just the marginal utility of consumption, okay? Um, at a given time, all right? Now, um, yeah, and because we did that current value Hamiltonian rather than the present value, it's relatively simple. If you do it in 
in the other form, you get exponential showing up, and it's it's not as fun. Uh, so that that's part of the advantage of you, of using the current value Hamiltonian. Okay, so so that's good. Um, the second condition, um, you know, I'll write it as like, what do we have? We had so, okay, forgot one thing. So one critical thing is when we wrote it in math form, we had rho, okay, and rho is whatever our discount rate is. I mean, technically here, okay, we're having some conductance issues. I actually have this like weird looking glove that that you can use that prevents this, but. I don't know. I forget where it is. Um, so, so this is really our our discount rate is really rho minus n in the objective function. Like our our, our rate of pure time preference is always rho, but the thing in the exponential is rho minus n. Okay. So when when we write this condition here, we need to write whatever is in the exponential, and that's going to change sometimes depending on like a normalization and stuff like that. So just be wary that it's not always just rho. It's whatever is in the exponential of your objective function. Okay, so rho minus n mu minus mu dot. Okay, and that's going to be equal to h uh, a. Okay, all right. Now h a is relatively simple. If you look, okay, so it doesn't uh, a doesn't show up in f the objective function. It shows up in g just with uh, mu and an r minus n attached to it. So mu r minus n. Okay, so that's it. Um, that's what we get. Okay, so now we can simplify this a little bit, right? Because there's a n times mu on the left and the right. Okay, so those are going to cancel, uh, and then we can kind of combine some some mu terms. Okay, so uh, I don't know how should we can write it as like mu dot is equal to. Um, Basically, rho minus r times mu. You shuffle things around a bit. You get mu dot is equal to rho minus r. Okay, so here, um, I guess this is. I mean, this is a not our final form, but it's you know fairly simple. Uh, I mean, this is just a if r, remember r can be grow, r can be changing arbitrarily basically over time. R, r is a function of t, so. It's not necessarily the simplest thing in the world, but say r was constant, this would all this would immediately tell us that mu is growing exponentially at rate r, uh, rho minus r. Okay, it's just going up or down or not moving depending on whatever that value is. Okay, so it could be positive or negative in principle. Um, we'll see in steady state it's going to be this. This would actually be negative in steady state. Uh, because of what R is going to end up looking like, but <clears throat> in, in principle and in the short run, you can be anything. All right. Okay, so that's that's good. Okay, so so here we are. Um, we have two differential equations in two variables. Okay, so so we could solve this in principle. Okay, and we are going to solve it. Um, now the ideal would be we can eliminate a variable. Okay, and and the true ideal would be that we eliminate mu because we don't really care about mu, right? I, you know, when you do a Lagrange optimization, usually your goal is to get to actually eliminate the Lagrange multiplier because it's just something you made up in the first place, all right? And you don't really care about it. So we're gonna, that's the goal here, all right? Um, okay, and then the, the key though is that the first equation actually isn't a differential equation, right? It's, it, it's just an equation that's true at every time. So this is like for all t. I mean, they're both for all t, but this is like sort of independently true for all t. Um, so we can, uh, since that's true for all t, we can actually take the derivative of it and we get an expression for mu dot and maybe we can combine that in such a way that, that we can eliminate mu. Okay, so that, that's basically what we're gonna do, okay? Um, yeah, okay, but then there's one thing I forgot. Well, there's a couple things I forgot. First of all, number three, the, there, there's still this condition that like we write it down, but we assumed it, so it's not really anything we're deriving, but it is still true that whatever that g function is, is operative. Okay, so that's good to know. Um, all right, uh, but then there's the, the, the fourth condition, which I forgot to mention basically up until now is, I alluded to is this transversality condition. Okay, um, I guess I can write it down here. Uh, so, so this is, um, yeah, I guess I didn't write it. 
Yeah, so let me start a new page. Look, I, I need to talk about the transversality condition for a minute here. Okay, so this is this actually does have some bite. Okay, um, we'll see later on. Okay, but right now, uh, what does this mean? So this is another condition for it's like a, a condition for optimality. Okay. All right, and, but it's a limiting condition. Okay, so in the most in the general sense that we had written it before with at, with x and y and f and g. Okay, it says that the limit of as t goes to infinity discounted of h of let's see. So I should yeah. I mean really I should write t x t y t. That just that h function basically should be equal to zero. Okay. So the, the, the discounted present value from the perspective of time t as t goes to infinity should be zero, okay? Um, so that's that's the base form. Okay, you can actually kind of simplify it. Not simplify it, but like you can get an easier to work with expression. Um, if you assume uh, f and g are weakly, not f over g, but f and g, I guess I should assume uh, f and g are weakly monotone then you can you can get a, a an easier to use and evaluate expression which looks like this okay and basically it says that the value of your state as valued by mu uh, and discounted appropriately should should be zero Okay, so if you think about uh, the, the Ramsey setting with assets, given that mu is evaluating how, how much we should value those assets, uh, this is just saying that the value of your assets as t goes to infinity should not grow faster than rho, or in the Ramsey case, rho minus n. Okay, so, um, and it, it kind of, I mean, it, it ensures that your utility is finite and well-defined, okay? Um, which it, which is why it's, it ends up being kind of uh, equivalent or, or implying this H form, the first form. Okay, so um, yeah, so so yeah, so you, you can't just keep borrowing forever. Basically, I mean you can, but you can't do it too much, such that your utility becomes ill-defined. All right, so that's that's the basic idea. We're gonna see exactly. It's it's actually going to when we do the graphical analysis, it's gonna sort of give us a little bit of a of a specific, it's gonna rule out weird paths and, and basically ensure that we only get one path. Okay, so we'll, it's gonna make more sense later on, okay? Um, but do, but it's not sweating too much right now. So, um, okay, so let's 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 go back to, to the to, to Ramsey, okay? So what do we have? Um, at the end of the day, we had that mu, is equal to u prime of c, and that mu prime uh, was equal to rho minus r, not rho minus n, rho minus r times mu. Okay, so this this is what we had to work with before the asset stuff, all that too. Transversality. So so in our case, like the transversality would be e to the minus rho minus n t and then mu of t and a of t now which is our state variable okay so that would be our transversality for this case okay so we'll, but we'll come back to that later on all right okay so uh so we want to we want to combine these and eliminate mu okay so the what we're going to do is we're basically going to take the the derivative of the first equation okay so mu dot is going to be equal to well it's going to be uh u double prime of c times c dot, right? Um, okay, and uh, yeah, now, so that's good. Okay, we, so one, one thing we could do is, you know, we have a, on the left, we have a, a mu dot equals something, on the right, we have mu dot equals something, combine those. And then sub of the mu, we get everything. So, so we can do that. Okay, so let's let's just do that. 
There, there's a quicker way, but we'll, we'll just do this the old fashioned way right now and then discuss. Okay, so then we get rho minus mu is equal to mu dot, which is equal to this u double dot of c, c dot. Now, it's important to remember the c dot, right? Because we're, we're, we're suppressing time subscripts, so it's easy to forget what's depending on time, but c is c of t. It's a path, the optimal path, okay? All right, so we have this rho minus r mu equals mu dot equals u double prime c, c dot. We also know that mu is equal to u prime, okay, the u mu thing, it turns out confusing. Um, so we're going to sub in like that. All right, so now this is an equation, certainly it, it is, we've eliminated mu, right? It's only an equation that depends on basically, it characterizes the path of, of consumption, okay? It's kind of ugly right now. Um, maybe we can work with it though. Okay, so let's say, okay, well, let's let's solve for C dot. That's how we usually kind of like to express these things. Okay, so then we're gonna get rho minus R times, I'll write it like this, U prime of C over U double prime of C. Okay, that's pretty good. I mean, we've got a ratio of some utility derivatives, all right? Um, now, <clears throat> uh, let's see. Um, this is this is all great. Uh, the last thing we can do is is really just a notational thing. Okay, so we, we have this says, given the value for c today, we can evaluate the derivative. We could accumulate this. We could do differential equation path plotting and everything like that. Okay, so this is valid. All right, uh, but we 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 can simplify it a little bit more actually. All right, uh, we we can introduce notation really. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're basically gonna divide by c. And turn it into a growth rate equation. I'm gonna like sidestep over to here. We're gonna divide it by c, and I'm gonna write like rho minus r u prime of c over c times u double prime of c. All right. Okay, so that's a growth rate equation. Now, on the left hand side, clearly we have the growth rate. We have rho minus r. That's a thing. All right, um, and then we have this. The derivative over C times the second derivative. Okay, it turns out that this is basically, it's, it's one over what we're gonna call the elasticity of, of U, U prime. All right, so we're gonna define EU, I'm gonna call it EU even though it really is EU prime just cause like the prime on a subscript always looks funky. Uh, EU prime is gonna be C times u double prime of c over u prime of c. So it's like given a utility function, we can, f and, and sorry, this, this, another thing that's sort of like easy to forget is that in general, this is a function of c, right? So for, for a given utility function, we can map this into a new function, which is the elasticity function, which is also a function of c, okay? So this is just like a notation, and I guess for that reason, I'll write triple equals, okay? And so in this equation, That'll give us what? Uh, sorry. First, that happened. I'm also going to throw a negative on the front of this. I forgot. Because u double prime is negative. You, it, and we're assuming utility is concave. So u double prime is negative. So we're going to also cancel that out. So epsilon is a positive number. So it's the elasticity of marginal utility. Okay. So this is saying this. Um, and then uh, minus rho minus r, and then one over epsilon u of c. Okay, so just subbing in for now that we have that, that notation. Okay, so this is, um, let me sure, let me just make sure I didn't make a sign error. Ah, wait, I might've made a sign error, let me think. No, no, I didn't. Okay, no, we're good. We did. We didn't make a sign error. Yeah, and then so yeah, and then notes. I have this as I just sort of distributed that uh, sign, that negative sign. All right. So, or you can write it like that. Okay. So, um, 
right? So that that's 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 what we have now. This is simpler, I guess, in some sense. Sorry, right, maybe we just sort of introduced notation to force it to be simpler. Um, but it actually is simpler in another way, which is that it turns out that epsilon is going to be relatively simple for our utility functions that we look at. Okay, and and uh, in particular, if we look at CRRA concept relative risk aversion which is related to this elasticity, basically, it's going to be exactly that the single parameter of CRRA is epsilon, is going to be epsilon, basically. Okay, so, um, all right, so in general, it, I mean, if for any general utility function, this is true, this works, okay? This this is uh, gives us a differential equation characterizing the path of C. We have that old differential equation characterizing the path of A when our forces combine we can solve everything. Okay, so that is all good, right? If you want to have a specific utility function like CRRA, well, it's even better um, because in the in the case of CRRA, uh, how are we writing CRRA these days? What's what's the okay? So we're writing it with the theta, which is our single parameter for it. Okay, we're writing it like this. The, the reason you've probably seen this, the reason we have the minus one is that that ensures that when theta can, goes to one, this actually becomes literal, literally the logarithm, okay? Um, without the one, it doesn't, it, it, weird stuff happens, okay? So you need the, the minus one on top. Um, okay, so the here we have, let's take derivatives. U prime of C, the way we set it up, conveniently enough, things cancel and you get C to the minus theta. That one disappears with the derivative anyway. Okay, and then you can see it's much easier to see that this is the logarithm when in, in derivative form because when theta equals one, it's one over c, which is the derivative of the log. Okay, uh, double prime, you get minus theta times c to the minus theta minus one. Okay, and that means if you evaluate that epsilon, you have c, that's minus c times, uh, you know, minus theta c to the minus theta minus one, all parenthesized, over u prime, which is c to the minus theta. Okay, so that's a lot of stuff there, but the negatives cancel, um, all of the c's cancel, and it just ends up being theta. Okay, so everything everything cancels except theta, basically. All right, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not immediately obvious, but yeah, it, they, they all cancel. Um, all right, so then, so that's cool because then in, in CRA land, then this is simply C dot over C is equal to R minus rho over theta. Very simple, right? And in fact, if, if we're in a steady state or something, then, <clears throat> uh, you know, and, and R is constant, that's some R star, this is just saying C is growing exponentially somehow, all right? And, uh, and, and even beyond that, you know, if, if we have, let's say we have no technological growth, in which case we would expect C to not grow at all in the long run, <clears throat> in which case that immediately tells us that R is equal to rho. Like if we want C to not be growing, we need R equals rho. So that actually gives us like a condition even, okay, um, for, for steady state equilibrium, all right? So, okay, so that's, that's cool. We, we, well, well, you know, we'll get, we'll give and take on CRA assumptions. Sometimes we'll use it, sometimes we won't. First, when we, we're going to look at this graphically later on, the, the graphic, the graphical analysis is, I think, is is pretty fun. Uh, it's, yeah. I mean, um, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have time to do it today. But I mean, you can draw basically a phase space. Okay, so remember, we have this, and we have our evolution of uh, a, right? So we have, the, these are now our, our two equations. Okay, I'll, let's say it, it might be general too. Okay, so these are our two equations. Um, <clears throat> and uh, let's see. So, yeah, I mean, we, we don't know what R and W are yet, but we'll get there. But we're going to get two equations in either C or an A or C or C and K later on, okay? And we're going to construct the a phase space, okay, which, which is just a two-dimensional space. And these equations will tell us how we move around in that space, okay? Um, and what we're going to do is kind of show that there's only one optimal path. Okay. Um, it, it'd be bad if there are multiple optimal paths. So we're going to show that there's only one. All right. 
and uh, essentially what we're going to show is that this phase space so the phase space is just like it's like a vector map you start somewhere and you follow the differential equations and you map map out all those little strands okay it's going to be kind of unstable in such a way that there's only one path you can take that gets you to steady state and everything else just goes off into some weird path which is which is uh, precluded based on either feasibility conditions or transversality conditions and things like that. So we're going to show that there's really only one optimal path, and we'll get an idea of basically what it looks like and how it how it responds when we change stuff in the environment. Okay, so um, yeah, that's that's sort of the name of the game. So we're going to do that phase based stuff. I think it's fun to draw graphs. Um, we're going to do stability later on, which I think is also pretty cool, uh, and we'll do stability analysis of the Ramsey model and see. Is, is it stable and when is it stable and, and everything like that or is it unstable because it's going to be it's actually going to be kind of confusingly it's it's going to be unstable because that's what gives you a single optimum if that makes sense it might not uh yeah that that is sort of unintuitive but that's that's going to be the case okay so but we'll talk about stability and stability stuff i think is also pretty cool and fun all right so um that's the plan any Thoughts about that? Parting thoughts? Are we are we ready for the weekend? Although you guys have more stuff to do tomorrow. You guys have a busy Friday. No, go for it. Go for it. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's that's some stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um well so the okay. I, I think usually the no Ponzi condition you can you can you can get away with just putting a, a lower bound, a, a large non binding lower bound kind of on assets uh because you know to, to run the ponzi you do need to go on forever right um and so if you just any lower bound that even if it's not binding will sort of preclude that um <clears throat> and i think yeah i mean it's like it's a little unclear i guess i mean is it suboptimal to run a ponzi or do we just not want it to happen you know uh I mean, part of the problem is that you, if you run a Ponzi, I think you get infinite utility. So it's like maybe not ideal. I mean, it, it's not. It's hard. It's hard to evaluate. Like it's hard to think about it even then because the utility integral is not well defined. Um, so I guess. I mean, but then it's like if it's infinite, then why wouldn't you try and do it? So I, I think it's really like. We know that you can't, that you probably can't run the Ponzi condition because you probably have some kind of bound on your assets position, right? Even if you're the richest person in the world, there's a, there's a limit, right? Um, and so if that were the case, that would preclude the Ponzi equilibrium. And then if we analyze it without the bound, maybe we'll get this Ponzi possibility, but like really we don't want to look at that, right? So we're kind of like, we're looking at optima that are not Ponzi schemes, and and that's what the transversality condition kind of gives you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pretty much. Um, it's it's very. Yeah, but it, it, if you like in a Shemogli, there's all these like sufficient conditions. There's different people named con conditions, so it, it, there's a lot of different things you can assume. But but yeah, it, I, I'm pretty sure that they, they basically they're close to equivalent. Yeah. <laughs> 